Welcome, everyone. Um, we're going to be discussing creating and operating a successful hybrid CR program today. Next slide. Greetings from the Take Heart and the ARC and CDC community. Uh, overview of the Take Heart initiative. We expanded, uh, that was our purpose, to the number of eligible patients participating in CR. And we did that by helping partner hospitals improve care coordination and implement automatic referral as two core strategies. We also looked at using hybrid CR to expand beyond center-based CR to help other patients. Uh, we had cohorts focused on care coordination and automatic referral, which are now complete. We also had a work group focused on the hybrid CR, uh, which has recently ended. And um, we're gonna be sharing today some of the <clears throat> information that came out of that work group. Uh, resources created for both of these efforts will be available at uh, the Take Heart website on the arc.gov uh, website. Uh, this website is under construction currently, um, but by the middle to, of December, it should be live. And here's a link to it. Next slide. We encourage you today to chat with us. Uh, we would like you to set your field to everyone. Um, so that everyone can see your question, including the panelists. Um, we'd like you to try that chat feature now, if you could, by just chatting in uh, a message to some of the other participants. Next slide. A little background. So for today's event, uh, we've been, over the last couple of years, sponsoring several Take Heart Affinity Group sessions. Um, we use them as a forum to, for participants to learn and share from each other on a variety of topics. Our, our goal is for everyone to learn, everyone to share, and everyone to support. Uh, this is our final affinity group session. Uh, we're gonna continue our process of learning and sharing as we're going to share what our work group uh, members uh, came up with during uh, the, their hybrid uh, brainstorming sessions. Uh, we're going to share an overview of insights and resources that can support creating a successful operating a hybrid CR rehab. Uh, we're going to share with you also an uh, introductory video with excerpts from a virtual supervised exercise session. Our format today is, is a moderated panel discussion. We have some of our work group members and we will be led by Dr. Stephen Katan. Again, reminder to use the chat feature to, to dialogue with participants and to foster peer-to-peer -peer sharing. Next slide. All right, more specifically, and this is Steve Hines from APT, and thanks, Teresa, and, and uh, all of our work group members. We're going to start off with a brief review of what hybrid cardiac rehabilitation is and why it's important to be thinking about for programs. Uh, I know that many of you are just uh, reopening and getting back to full capacity, but hybrid uh, may be an important thing for you to consider, and we're delighted you're on the call today. You'll see that we're going to address um, the issues that are listed here um, uh, uh, in the next hour. We can't possibly cover all of those issues, but we just want to give you some insights from the work group uh, and, and also create awareness of the kinds of resources that you'll find in the implementation guide and the resources guide that will be available on the website. So those are the things that we're going to be talking about. I want to introduce our panelists for today on the next slide. Um, you'll see that we've got a, a fabulous pay, uh, panel, uh, Caitlin Coppenrath, uh, Ann Gavit ott Stephen Katayan, uh, Karen Louie, Drew, Drew Ayler, and, and Vicki Yandel, uh, all um, uh, except Karen were work group members and, um, and are directly involved either in the facilitation of a, an operating hybrid program or in the, in the implementation or planning for one. So, so that's our panel for today. Uh, it's a great panel. We want to acknowledge, as you see on the next slide, that we had other work group members as well. They aren't on the panel today, but uh, on the next slide, you can see who they are. Um, and many of them are, are participants on today's call and may be responding to comments in the chat as well. So um, our, our thanks to all of them. Uh, we learned an incredible amount from them. If you look on this next slide, we asked a, each of you when you registered what your current involvement with hybrid cardiac rehabilitation was. About half of you, a little more than half of you, 
um, don't provide anything other than on-site cardiac rehab. And we're delighted that you're interested enough to participate in today's event. Um, and then about uh, a quarter of you said other, and we're not quite sure what that means. So um, if you're doing something different from what these other categories and you just wanna enter it in the chat, we'd love to see that. Uh, and then some of you already are involved with the hybrid program and we're delighted that you're participating as well. There's always things to be learned from others. And I think that all of us learned um, uh, in each of the work group sessions. So having said that, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Stephen Katayan, who was the co-chair of the uh, of the work group, and will be um, uh, uh, talking us through the topics um, uh, during the rest of the presentation today. Thanks, Stephen. Welcome, everyone. Uh, over the first couple slides here, I want to I'd like to get us all on the same page about what hybrid cardiac rehabilitation is in terms of by definition. And then from that, we'll move through the topics that uh, Steve reviewed relative to uh, the components of a hybrid cardiac rehabilitation program. And, and, and this information on this slide here is somewhat self-explanatory in terms of what it is and what it is not. Uh, a few highlights to, to just to reemphasize. Uh, hybrid cardiac rehabilitation represents a mix between center-based and remotely conducted, whether it's in the community or at home, remotely conducted exercise sessions. What's unique about hybrid cardiac rehabilitation is that those remote sessions um, are supervised, audiovisual, real-time, synchronized, virtually supervised exercise sessions. That's the unique part of this. And from that, we still want to deliver the core components of cardiac rehabilitation, as you can see listed on the bottom. Those aren't shifted off because this is a hybrid program. Those are incorporated into this model that we'll call hybrid cardiac rehabilitation. The next slide, if you will. And this is just a nice picture of um, it, the, what I just mentioned diagrammatically. On the, on the left there is the typical facility-based cardiac rehabilitation. The clinician sees the, the patient in a brick and mortar setting, whereas hybrid combines the two. It combines facility based with some type of synchronized real time audiovisual supervised exercise. We can have other connects uh, with the patient as well, synchronized or asynchronized. We can talk to them while they're uh, while they're exercising, but it's not it's not a visual connect. We can talk to them uh, hours later or days later after they've exercised, we can, ed we can ed educate them um, sometime else during the week, but those would be in, in an asynchronous manner. The two key components though are facility-based and synchronized um, supervised exercise. Next slide. So again, as we're all aware, um, there are benefits, excuse me, there are challenges to getting patients into cardiac rehabilitation and a potential patient benefit from a hybrid program is it helps overcome a lot of these, a lot of these, uh, these um, barriers or challenges that these patients confront. Uh, confront doesn't solve them all. Um, other alternative models might work uh, as well, but hybrid is just one method to help solve these barriers as we go along. And and um, this is in addition to the potential. Uh, automatic referral and care coordination steps that we've talked about before in the take heart model. This the layering hybrid cardiac rehabilitation on top of this may provide additional benefit. Next slide. And just like there's patient benefits, there are potentially program benefits as well. And um, a big program benefit potentially is to increase the capacity of what your program can handle and reduce wait time. Now, the reason I say this is important is we've heard before, or at least we've discussed before, that if all cardiac rehabilitation programs fully, fully engaged and, and were opt operating optimally, we'd only see about 50% of the eligible people for cardiac rehabilitation in the US. And we wanna get to 70%, 70% plus participation in the US. So we have to have non-traditional ways to go ahead and deliver cardiac rehabilitation. We need to be thinking about this today. And a hybrid model, and there are others, but a hybrid model would be one way to go ahead and do it. 
Uh, there are some other there are some other benefits that the program is able to uh, derive as a result of hybrid. Um, patient satisfaction scores are high, just like they are in facility based. Potentially reten potentially retention is better, um, and and we'll hopefully would be able to get access to underrepresented patient groups that might not participate in your facility based programs. And these could be people that are afraid to come into a facility and exercise. These could be people that that live rurally and um, uh, might not be able to ha handle a long drive coming in for cardiac rehabilitation. And then we, f we have found that uh, staff appreciate this diversion, this new workflow, this innovative workflow that helps break up their day. It's a different technology they can get involved with. Next slide. So I'm, I want to take an active role here, but as a moderator. So we um, are going to work through now some of the key steps, some of the key issues associated with um, starting and implementing a hybrid program. And one of the first things we have to do is uh, identify, excuse me, is get buy-in from our key stakeholder, stakeholders. And listed here are, um, some of the common stakeholders we would we we brainstormed on that we thought would be important that you consider involving these may shift at your own institution some may take on a bigger role or a small or a smaller role um, I, I personally suggest as you engage these stakeholders that you don't do it in hallway discussions that you do it formally in meetings set up the time so it makes it makes it to increase its importance. And uh, on the right, there are some of the key questions they may ask of you that you need to be ready to respond to. So what I'd like to do now is to turn it over to Anne, give her a little bit of time, and then turn it over to Vicki and give her a little bit of time so they can both speak to how they start up, or, or excuse me, how they received buy-in at their institutions. Anne, would you like to go first? Sure, thank you, Stephen. Um, so yeah, to your point, this is a very important part of um, developing a program if you aren't already um, in the midst of doing a hybrid program. And I would just, um, I think from my perspective, address a couple of these in particular. I think, you know, this list um, is pretty comprehensive. It may not include everyone, but the ones that um, to us were very important in particular were number one, administration. And I will say that from um, our program development perspective, we started right after COVID. And so I feel like we had fewer barriers um, with our administration than usual because they were looking for ways for us to increase our volume. Um, we had by design um, decreased the number of patients we were able to see at a time. And so we had some backup of volume. And one of our administrators had actually read an article in one of his, his hospital administration journals. and. We had already started the discussion and then he said, oh, I see that this is a thing. So they were actually very supportive um, because they were looking at it from the perspective of actually enhancing volume and revenue. The other key partner I would say to us was the physicians, um, our medical director, as well as our cardiology group. And they were, of course, looking at it from a different perspective. They wanted to know, number one, um, is this a program that will still have the effectiveness of a facility-based program? And number two, equally important, um, would this be a safe program for their patients because it was completely new to them? So I think with our physicians coming at it from a science perspective of, you know, the, the research that existed, and it wasn't really robust, but the little bit that we could find showing that there was safety, um, and in particular, um, looking at in that at that time, at least stratifying our patients. So we were sort of selecting those patients that um, we felt comfortable and our physicians felt comfortable um, doing this program remotely. So that was um, kind of our approach to our physicians and they've also been very supportive. Um, and then thirdly, um, for us, the information technology was extremely important. Um, I didn't know until we met with information technology that we already had a platform built into our electronic medical record system that allowed us to do virtual sessions um, and virtual group sessions um, through our patient portal. And this actually made it um, easier for us because we could schedule, register, um, patients in that way, they could link in through their patient portal, which they were already um, familiar with. Um, so it made things a lot more seamless and less expensive to us. 
so I would say um, those three um, were some some things that I, I would point out. That's that's perfect. Uh, um, Vicki, I know you were post COVID in terms of when your program started up. Let's go to the next slide if we could, Miriam. Uh, do you want to comment uh, relative to how your pro program came alive? So we started our program <clears throat> in May of, of 2022, and uh, we had six programs close, cardiac and pulmonary rehab programs closed in South Carolina and several more closing after that. And so we saw a need to, uh, to expand our services and uh, try to cover some of these areas that we could not get reach the patients. Um, so when we talked to our medical director, um, she was immediately on board with this and from going to her to the executive leadership, they're like, this is a no brainer. Um, and of course, then you have to talk about the money. Um, but that's another story. Um, but, but that was our biggest, I mean, I didn't have any hurdles with our administrative team. So that, that was 1 of the best things that that, um, our program. Um, they understood the need for cardiac rehab, and we wanted to provide that service to the outlying areas. But um, my, my, my best advice would be is to talk with somebody that you're comfortable with at the organization. If you're close to a cardiologist or a medical director, get them and, and, and have them understand the process because it's, it's really not that hard. Yeah, you know, Vicki just alluded. Thanks, Vicki. Vicki just alluded to a point that I wanted to highlight. And some of you might some of you might be saying that, geez, we would have a hard time engaging our medical director in this. He's not actively or she's not actively involved in the program. And, and I'm sensitive to that and I understand that. But you maybe have a key referrer who are a top referrer or a champion for your program in other ways. Maybe pull him or her to be the champion for this hybrid model and, and bounce off of them the concept and see if they would help go with you at administration that carries more weight when you go in with a physician champion as well. So it doesn't always have to be your medical director. Uh, often it will be, but uh, other physician champions can uh, fill the role as well. Uh, Vicki mentioned, uh, Vicki mentioned um, that uh, I think I forget her exact words, but cost or finances is something we wanted to tackle. So we actually slotted this second because it is extremely important. If we could go um, to the next slide, if you would, and and there are, and we want to draw Karen Louie into this discussion and let her have her uh, freedom to discuss. But but there's a couple different ways the work group identified, you know, finances maybe being structured. One is the traditional reimbursement model where we provide a service and we get reimbursed, and and we'll, we'll touch upon that. But you've got to start to broaden your thinking to other areas to make your business case as you talk to others, talk to administrators, talk to physicians. Um, uh, that being that maybe you have to get a grant from a service organization to initially underwrite the costs or ask if you've got a key patient donors who would be willing to donate money to, to you know, fulfill a grant that would be able to help underwrite a, uh, underwrite a cost. And then, and then don't forget there's organizational reputation, you know, reputation, perceived value, missions and, and, and attributes that go along with offering a very unique, uh, uh, unique um, uh, delivery method for cardiac rehabilitation. I do know internally that we did value that quite highly. And then there's indirect financial benefits. So maybe it's not the, the maybe your institution is willing to sacrifice a little bit costs up front to save to save, um, you know, um, you know, uh, other costs, hospitalization costs uh, down the road. So, Karen, this slide and the next slide are yours. Just at, you know, twenty thousand feet. Could you help us think about this relative to to these topics and the next slide as well? I, I can a bit. Let's go to the next slide, and so I don't get um, sidetracked. <laughs> but um, re reimbursement has already been a word used a few times to this point. Let me just run through some basics that I think everybody is aware of, but um, it helps to hear it again to confirm what, what you know you know. Medicare, fee-for-service, they call it, FFS, has covered during the PHE and will cover through the PHE, which right now is um, April 11th of 2023. So uh, it could be beyond that, nobody knows, but it's at least for the next four months. 
and they have covered it just as if it was delivered in the hospital setting. Same same payment, some technical changes, a modifier on on billing it, but nothing nothing at all um, that would be a barrier or um, just um, make it impossible to do. Medicare Advantage, and we know we have about 50% of our um, patients, our Medicare patients are probably under an MA plan now. They must cover what fee-for-service Medicare covers. They can cover more, they can be more flexible, but they can't cover less and deny things that the patient would get under fee-for-service. So that's important to know when you're talking to your MAOs, your Medicare Advantage organizations, they have, every one of them has the option to waive co-pays. I think we should all be asking that question on the front end for every patient who comes in under an MAO because they often don't know they have that ability. There are a lot of Medicare Advantage plans out there. Some are from the top down, um, and those are great because we can get to the top and educate and, and dialogue with them. But some are regional and smaller, and they, they don't, um, we kind of know more about our services than they do sometimes. Um, commercial payers, you know, they can do what they decide to do. They make the call. Some follow Medicare, but not all. Um, some will say this is experimental and we aren't going to cover it. They'll say that with some things we know are not really experimental, like 93797, non-monitored ECG, but that's their um, that's their byline. We don't cover that experimental. And others have said, it doesn't matter to us how you get the outcomes as long as you're successful getting those outcomes. And that's what we want and have come across some um, with some payers as well. So got to ask and dig in and keep that um, in the forefront. Now, uh, we, uh, let me say a few words about remote physiological monitoring, RPM codes. That is not cardiac rehab. I'll say that to my grave. Um, RPM codes do not equal, are not the equivalent of cardiac rehabilitation. There are physician codes and the RPM codes are for physicians and they come into use under certain um, bundles of patients. They call it chronic care management. And so RPM codes are available to the physicians to use for patients who have, um, you know, a number of chronic diseases and you're, you're trying to track and, and treat and monitor a lot of different things going on for those patients. So I'll say it again, that is for physician offices, not for hospital, um, not for hospitals to bill. So I don't expect that to come up today. And those RPM codes are not phase three. I've heard that. Um, Medicare doesn't cover phase three. That means phase three, phase four, maintenance, whatever you want to call it, semantics. But RPMs don't equal uh, maintenance, uh, self-pay, cardiac rehab either. Uh, and as we're talking about reimbursement, we all, as, as has come up, um, Prior to this, it's not all about the reimbursement. You know, we came into um, the PHE and we figured out ways to continue to meet our patients' needs. And with some, it was an asynchronous, non billable phone call. And that was our lifeline to the patients, right? I, I met a number of patients that just really appreciated that. So, not billable, but very valuable for the patients, for your program, got us through the pandemic. So, as Stephen, when, when we had the graph of, you know, in-person, synchronous, billable, virtual, there may be a place for asynchronous, but it's not at this point a uh, billable service. And I, I think I don't want to um, beat a dead horse, but virtual delivery of cardiac rehab under Medicare ends when the PHE ends as it stands right now. We are certainly pursuing options to to find a way to deliver virtually different bills legislatively but um, that's a process in motion but as it stands right now cms doesn't have the uh, statutory ability to extend it beyond the phe we operate under the waivers 
that the hospitals were given during the pandemic. So, so Karen brings up a good point that some somewhere down the road, Karen, Medicare will say the PHE is over, public health emergency is over, and then our ability to bill for cardiac rehabilitation in that model would see. So we're going to have a reimbursement gap, whether it's six months or six years until Medicare recognizes virtual cardiac rehabilitation permanently through, through their, their statutes. I would turn that around to the people on the call here today and say some of the responsibility rests on our shoulders to now work with your commercial insurers. So in the state of in the state of Michigan, we approached Blue Cross Blue Shield. They enthusiastically endorsed and wanted to reimburse for this. I believe, um, Vicki, if I'm correct, um, in South Carolina, you approached them as well, and they agreed to it. So it's on it's on our shoulders to take you know instead of being passive active to get these other people involved in thinking about reimbursement. Karen, a comment on that before we go to the next slide. We could we could go on all day with examples of Medicare following what we were already doing with private payers, like like paying for heart failure, way back in the you know 1990s. Good point. Blue Cross did, and it took look how long it took for CMS to recognize, to have enough evidence from their perspective to cover heart failure. So you're absolutely right, Stephen. I think we continue to see the value and know it, but um, look to those insurers who are um, recognizing the value of it. Okay. So I wanna shift now from what one might say is preliminary material in terms of how do we think about funding and how do we think about getting buy-in to what's it look like? What's the nuts and the bolts? What do we have to do to start and run a, a hybrid session? So we have two people we want to draw in he, here, Dr. Ayler, Drew Ayler, um, and and uh, Caitlin. So Caitlin, could you go first maybe and just talk at a high level in terms of how you start or restart uh, um, hybrid at your, at your institution in Maine? Yeah. So. After the pandemic, um, there was a lot of interest by providers and our medical director and our team, a huge backlog of patients. Um, we knew we had to do something. So we we sort of moved quickly and we had a lot of buy-in from administration. And we started offering virtual cardiac rehab to patients that were going to decline us or that were otherwise not able to make it into the center. Um, and we were doing that one-on-one -on -one with an exercise specialist. So we had two exercise specialists that were very used to doing um, group you know, exercise instruction, and they were pretty excited to do this. They were sort of the champions at that time. And they would run these sessions and kind of individually schedule these patients where it worked in their schedule. Um, and we had a, a lot of considerations to do at that time, like how do we orient the patient and what we would do is we would talk to the patient while they were in the center during their intake and during the first few sessions with us, make sure they were comfortable with Zoom, um, make sure they had a, a good comfortable plan at home. Um, we would give them some resistance bands to do at home and sort of mimic what they were gonna do at home in the center so that we knew it was safe. Um, and then they would meet with the exercise specialists at their home. Um, there were a, there was a lot of anxiety from our program with, okay, what happens in an emergency situation? How do we, can we take these high risk patients? Um, our heart failure team, the doctors, they, they fell in love with this program and they kept sending us very high risk heart failure patients that then we kind of decided we weren't comfortable with yet. Or we, you know, we didn't have the experience to do that. So, um, with a long story, trying to make it shorter, this implementation guide that the group has put together is going to be super helpful. Um, it gives the confidence and now our program is ready to restart with intention. Um, we know, okay, we're only gonna be offering this to people where it makes sense medically for them. Um, you know, it's not for everyone, it's not the, it's not the only answer that's going to solve our enrollment issues. It's a answer that's going to work for some people. Um, 
and they have to be comfortable with technology. They have to be functional and safe. Um, in terms of staff burden and anxiety, anxiety, we're looking forward to doing it in a group session with patients and not one on one to be more efficient. Um, that was kind of affecting our staff morale there, like the buy in. Um, and then we've also, you know, I've been able to give them bits and pieces of this implementation guide being involved in this work group. Um, but they've also observed some sessions that, you know, from Henry Ford, we're a well established program. So they feel more com confident. We have a group of 5 staff members that are going to champion our restart of this program. Um, and I just feel like we have a, a better infrastructure to put this together this time around. So, so Caitlin, do, do, did you have, do you have a waiting list? Do you see this being as a way to help accommodate more patients? I do. I feel like. It will, I'm anticipating that it's going to reduce our wait list because if, you know, if we can get people in here sooner um, and then have them come to the facility once a week, but the other two are remote or um, maybe they front load their in center sessions and do the rest from home, we'll be able to handle a higher volume of patients um, and we'll be able to reach more people, which is really the most important thing. Okay. So, Drew, um, open forum for you from a physician's perspective, you know, any topics, but medical or, or, or higher level thinking about uh, operating a non traditional program. I want to give you a minute or two just to talk to these issues or others if you see them. Yeah, thanks so much, uh, Dr. Tan. Um, first, <clears throat> it, it really warms my heart to see so many. In attendance for 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 something that means so much to me, so. Um, Kudos to everybody for joining. Um, starting up is is a really exciting part of this process um, um, because you can express a lot of creativity. Um, from from my perspective, uh, in terms of patient recruitment, um, in in our program, this should mirror patient recruitment for facility based programs almost exactly. Um, such that what you're creating um, is a menu of options for um, your cardiac rehab intervention, whether that is facility based or hybrid based. Um, and and the analogy here is is uh, dosing of medications. You know, for any particular patient, um, uh, a medication can be dosed at low dose, medium dose, high dose, um, and um, that's not to say that hybrid cardiac rehab is is a low dose medication, but it's tailored to the patient. Um, and so, um, uh, in in our program, at least, uh, remote cardiac rehab stands as an option right next to uh, our North Hills location um, and all the other uh, locations in our system. Um, and that's really the only bullet that I'd like to focus on for. Um, startups regarding patients. A really interesting component of uh, startup is thinking broadly about um, whether a vendor will be used or not. And uh, there's a there's a slide next on this, but um, before we get there, uh, I will say that um, you know our health system. Thought a lot about this and piloted a program with a vendor. Uh, and there's a there are a number of questions that you can um, think about asking when you're considering whether to use a vendor and, and which vendor to use because there are a number of them, and they're all to some extent pioneering. Um, uh, it's important to note that that. Uh, Pioneering is a part of this because you have opportunities to be creative. And what I mean by that is um, a, a vendor can uh, provide your entire cardiac rehab product. A vendor can provide a platform only for administering remote sessions in a similar way that this video chat is a platform for, um, for having some kind of group conversation. We could all be exercising right now. Um, uh, or a, a, a uh, 
a vendor um, you know, could provide some staff, but not all staff, and the medical director could be located on site. All of these reflect different priorities of each individual institution and are, and are questions that you need to answer for yourself. In our case, um, the vendor provides everything but the medical director, and I'm the medical director of the remote re rehab, um, hybrid rehab product. So, so Drew on several occasions mentioned questions, uh, go to the next slide if you would, questions that could be asked, and we actually put together a series of questions. You can't read this, it's intentional, it's too small, you'll be tested on it later, but, but um, this, this is one of the um, resources that we put in the implementation guide. We brainstorm questions that we think one might want to ask for of potential vendors for those organizations that are considering starting a program. So to be even taken it that far in terms of questions to consider. Um, let's pause for a second if we could, and we think a, a picture might be worth a thousand words. So we're going to play for you a 90 second clip of a hybrid virtual a virtual session from a hybrid cardiac rehabilitation program in operation so you can just see what it looks like. This full clip, the full, I think it's 18 minutes, will be available as a resource for you to really sink your teeth into and see how things are delivered. Let your staff see, let your staff feel comfortable with, et cetera. So if, if you don't mind uh, going to the next slide and playing the video clip, that would be, that would be help, helpful, Mary. Sure. All right. Um, so Laura said she's 10 minutes in. Howard, where are you in your exercise right now? So you mean, are you talking about the time wise? Yep. Yep. So it's, uh, hang on, it's popping up already 15 minutes and 28 seconds. So that's five, five minute warm up and 10 minutes of uh, exercise. Yep. Okay. Very good. And everybody feeling okay so far? Yep. Yep. Okay. Um, Keith, since you are the farthest in, let's grab your heart rate and set here. So what is your treadmill set at? Uh, incline six. Okay. Two point five. Awesome. And heart rate? One hundred and three. Beautiful. So right in that range. All right. Um, Howard, let's get your set. Um, you're exercising on the bike. What is your level at? It's resistance three. Okay. And um, the RPMs are, I believe, six. It's, it'll give me about two seconds here. It's, it's okay. Like, I think it's it was 66, but I'll double check in one sec here. And then 66.2. Uh, uh, yeah, 66. Okay. And what is your heart rate right now? 98. All right. And how hard would you say this is? Same 11 and 12, you know, that, that, that green, you know, <clears throat> yeah, the middle 11, I think it's 11. Yep. Well, hopefully that was helpful to see a live session again, the, um, the full dose of that, so to speak, the full play of that will be, um, Posted as a resource, uh, so probably is made available sometime in mid December. It's about 18 minutes long. It, it shows the delivery of patient education, uh, shows more interaction with the patients, has some personal conversations with Kat. She was the exercise physio clinical exercise physiologist there that, that was leading the session, giving giving some of her pers perspectives in terms of how she handles different situations. So I encourage you to see that. Miriam, could you go to the next slide, uh, please? So let's move from from launching that that first visit to uh, more in detail after we just viewed the session. Um, you know, operating a a, a a a hybrid session. What do we have to do to facilitate that? And I wanted to, I wanted to draw in Drew and Vicky um, into this conversation in terms of how they think of the, the sessions should be should be operated. Vicky, do you mind? Maybe you lead off, and we'll finish with Drew, but. Um, from your from your higher level, these topics or others, 
uh, what things do you think of, um, and these will be expanded on in the implementation guide, but what factors do you think of or do, do you put into play when you try to run a, run a session? So the biggest thing was what platform we were going to use, and uh, we use video, which the hospital already had. Um, and then we actually had the patient come in, go over everything with them, sign their consent forms, and make sure they knew how to work the, the video uh, connection. And once we were able to get that, um, they went to their home, they signed in with me, and they exercised. We told them what level to keep them at. We quantified their MET level. Um, some patients decided they want to walk outside and they didn't want to do exercise equipment. And so what we did was we calculated the MET level from their steps that they did. Um, it, the best thing I ever did, and I tell Dr. Katayan this all the time, is that he let me observe his, his program. And being able to observe a real life virtual based cardiac rehab program is essential for anybody starting a program. Um, I know any of us on this panel would uh, love to have you come in, but that was the that was the key to making it easy and seeing that we could do this. And it wasn't that hard. We do this every day. We work with the patients. The ITP is the same identical information that you're going to be collecting that you do at the the, the campus based program. Vicky, um, did you Vicky, did you did you do your ITPs during a session or did you have them come in for their ITPs or both? Uh, we did it both actually. Um, but the majority was all done uh, virtually. So I'd ask them what, what they're, you know, were they still smoking? Now, as for the depression and the psychosocial aspect of that, I took them offline and we talked privately about that because you do have, to, I mean, nobody wants to say I'm depressed. Um, and so we did, we were able to take them into a different room and talk with them, uh, you know, about the psychosocial um, aspect and were they having depression or anxiety and how could we help with that? Um, also, one of the biggest things with us, the patients always wanted to see the dietitian. So every Thursday we had our dietitian on and I loved how she would snake in her, her education because the patients would say, oh my gosh, Thanksgiving's coming up. You know, how am I not going to eat all that food? And I mean, she was just sly as a dog. She would get in there and tell them great little tips what they could do. You know, not that eating tofu and, you know, for Thanksgiving, but, but real life food, how are you going to handle this every day? You know, I, you know, I want all this food. Well, no, take little portions. And so we should get a plate and she'd show them exactly what we, you know, they should do. And when the patients came back from Thanksgiving, they were like, oh my gosh, it wasn't that hard, you know, but they, they had her there that they could ask her questions. And, and for me, that was one of the, the best parts of having this is that I could have the dietitian in every week with them. I, I'm going to cut you off there, Vicki, and then move, move on to Dr. Ayler. Just, again, higher level, Drew, uh, data you want to see captured, how are patients monitored, any comments across any of these topics? Yeah, thank you. Um, in terms of patient monitoring, uh, ultimately, the intervention that you that you choose to make for a hybrid cardiac rehab product, it, it has to be feasible and workable for people. What a point that was brought up earlier in this talk um, uh, is that there are certain groups of people left out of facility-based cardiac rehab, and one meaningful group um, are um, elderly patients' transportation issues, um, and and and, uh, and so um, burdening patients with a tremendous amount of monitoring equipment um, that that's technically complex it would be problematic, and 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 would not solve the problem of of that population um you know not to mention that uh cardiac rehab staff would have to have to negotiate all those things with relatively minimal benefit to having that information you can see from uh the henry ford model that um it's it's a it's a it's information monitoring information that's immediately available from most exercise equipment um a, a heart rate check and then Sometimes if you have an automated blood pressure cuff, that would be helpful too. But um, these are basic pieces of information to demonstrate uh, um, that a patient is in fact exercising, which brings just one second point here. Um, as the number of, of, uh, of models of hybrid cardiac rehab kind of propagate, um, it, there's 
there's a possibility that um, the intervention would be diluted by um, by uh, hybrid models that don't in fact lead to exercise or or that don't fulfill the ACVPR and and um, uh, and those um, kinds of metrics and goals for for a cardiac rehab intervention. So um, ensuring that you're you're uh, uh, documenting um, metrics over the course of of your hybrid CR product that um, that demonstrates continued exercise in, uh, and at a at a moderate intensity or whatever intensity you determine with your patient is going to be very important. The second part is um, safety issues. I think this comes up a lot with physicians, um, and uh, at, at our um, uh, health system, we have a medical director, which is myself, who's available. Um, I will say, you know, anecdotally th throughout the course of our entire um, uh, program's life, uh, there's, there's, I can count on one hand the number of, of times that I've been called. They've not been called for emergencies. They've been called, I've been called for to facilitate communication and those kinds of things. Um, so it's, it's not, uh, a big ask that you're asking your medical director, um, and uh, and then secondarily for as a as a safety issue, um, you can as a part of your onboarding or startup process. Uh, at least this is what we do. Um, we kind of risk stratify certain patients, and this is something that Caitlin alluded to earlier. Um, the AACVPR has a you know has an algorithm for risk stratification, and we simply use that. Um, and initially, because our program is relatively young, we're uh, we're we're um, we're not including high risk patients. But we've discussed and probably will ultimately um, include high risk patients who have been evaluated, uh, um, you know, pending an evaluation on their initial on site visit at a at a facility. Um, so if if they have a good visit, a good visit and demonstrate safety, um, then they then that's their gateway to enter into the remote program, even if they are high risk. Okay, good, good stuff. I want to uh, take the last 10 or 12 minutes or so and go to the last 2 components of. Operating the program, the 1st, 1 next slide, if I could, the next 1. Has to do with educating patients. Uh, this is this is part of the core components of what we deliver in cardiac rehabilitation. So we are responsible to deliver this, whether we deliver it during the times they're with us with brick and mortar, or we come up with creative ways to deliver it while they're exercising remotely. But we're still responsible to provide patient education, behavior change, and I know Ann Gavick has done a, a fair amount of uh, put put a fair amount of time against this, and I was going to let Ann, if you don't mind, uh, you know, put put your expertise or experience here. That would be helpful. Sure. Thank you, Stephen. Um, I feel like this part of hybrid cardiac rehab is is honestly the easiest. Um, at least it was for us because we really aligned our education for the um, remote cardiac rehab sessions to the education for our facility based cardiac rehab. So we follow the same schedule of sessions. Um, the staff member providing the remote session um, provides that education. It's either a presentation dialogue, um, sometimes supplemented with PowerPoint or video as well. And then usually at the next session that week, they follow up on that content with um, Q&A and just to um, see if patients have any questions about the content that was provided. Um, in addition to that, you know, we have, as we all do have um, access to many online educational resources so they can assign those to patients as well. Sometimes they do that before asking them to, you know, visit that site prior to the presentation that's taking place. So, um, you know, we use that as we do at our facility based program as supplemental. Um, and then for patients who um, wish to have a consultation with a dietitian or the tobacco cessation specialist, we can schedule those via Zoom call or if they're coming in for a facility-based session, we can coordinate it with that session. Um, so the education, I feel like, works pretty seamlessly. Um, and likewise, with outcomes, uh, we use the same outcome assessment tools that we use with our facility-based program. Um, the patients at our program have the option to do those either through the patient portal 
or to do them on paper. Um, and so those outcome measurements or assessments are used at the beginning of the program and again at the end. And then likewise with any biometric um, measurements or functional measurements, we do those. Um, we do their assessment um, live. They come into our uh, facility to have their initial consultation. So we do those live and then we do those again at the end. So I feel like both for education and outcomes, um, it's for us, it's been a pretty seamless process. Thanks, Ann. That's a good lead, lead in. Caitlin, do you want to touch base? Next slide, if you would, touch base on outcomes. Yeah, so as we know in our field, outcomes are probably the most important thing that we do. Data is what tells our story. And, our, you know, the data is how we demonstrate our effectiveness and, you know, quality improvement. It's how we request things when we need them. Um, so it, it will be really important, and the group all agreed that try to align the outcomes that you measure with exactly what you measure for center-based cardiac rehab and also align with not only the enrollment rates and the referral rates, but all of the performance measures. Um, it's important to track how many sessions patients have that are remote versus center-based um, and does it, and then, then we can look at it and does this program that you created, does it help with enrollment rates? Does it help um, with your patients that decline? Um, are you having a greater completion rate because they're able to complete more at home or before they go to work? Um, and then we can also look at things like, are the performance measures similar? So are we still getting the same, you know, improvement in functional capacity, even when they're exercising at home? Uh, are they at optimal blood pressure control? Um, are there depression screens, you know, making improvements in the 12 weeks you have them? And then another important one to consider would be patient satisfaction. You know, are they more satisfied where they don't have to spend the money to the gas money to drive to your center three days a week, um, or they can still go to work and they don't have to find childcare and they can still participate in cardiac rehab and complete the full program. I think those are all really important things to look at and analyze, and it will help us justify, you know, internally how effective our program is, but also externally to the payers that this is an important program that we need to keep, they need to keep providing for us. So. So, so, Caitlin, just, just to clarify for the group, when you talk about compare hybrid versus facility only, the comparison is not one is superior to the other, but just to demonstrate that they're equal, right? That, that right. neither is inferior. They're both equal in what they deliver, right? Right. And, you know, just, it will tell the story. It will show, okay, we were able to reach this many more patients or, you know, we provided this many more sessions being able to offer this. I think that will speak volumes, you know, to, to our field for sure. sure. And, and I just want to bounce back to you for a second. Do, do you pull in your, uh, Vicki mentioned that they pull in their dietitian. Do you, have you pulled in another health professional to, to, to deliver the content? You're on mute, Ann. Yes, at this point, we've done that only for um, our individual consultations. Right now, um, our dietitian does provide group education at our facility-based program, but because of timing, um, we haven't used our dietitian at this point to provide um, the remote sessions. So our staff right now is providing, it's the same content, you know, that's provided at our facility based, but it's done by our who's ever leading the remote session. Um, however, for tobacco cessation and um, dietary individual consultation, we do pull in those specialists. Okay. I, I just want to say one more thing too. It doesn't have to be hard. So making it as easy as possible for yourself, um, using a specific visit type in your EMR, um, you know, it's, it's not extremely difficult to run reports in your EMR to make these comparisons and get this information, it, you know, try to make it as simple as possible to get these important outcomes. Good point. 
Uh, Steve Hines, I think that concludes my role. Did, did you want to pick it back up from here and take us down the last couple slides? Sure, I would be happy to do that. And if we move on to um, the next slide, final advice from today's panel, uh, we want to just check in, you know, 15, 20 seconds of advice that you would give to any program that's thinking about starting um, or, or, or trying to improve their hybrid program. Um, let's just go in reverse order. So we'll start with Vicki. Again, I think just getting involved with another program and seeing how it's performed for a couple of weeks will give you a, will really ease your, your level of anxiety because my staff had a lot of anxiety when we were starting this off. Um, and so once we were able to see what, how the program operated, it, it was amazing. It, it, it really, it's not that hard. All right. Thanks very much. Drew. Uh, from my perspective, I, I think the, um, the, the area that's, that's not, uh, that's not, um, that's going to create difficulties is, is interfacing with administration, um, to find out whether this is something that you'd like to do in a homegrown fashion or, um, outsource to, uh, vendors. And so being careful, um, to fully vet those vendors, um, to ensure they meet the standards that AACVPR has set and will continue to set, um, is uh, is going to be important to keep this a pure intervention. All right, thanks, Karen. You know, I uh, wish I had my own program so I could dive into this because I remember from the very beginning, Dr. Katayan and and Robert Berry saying, you know, it's not that hard. We you start with one or two and you grow it from there. See what works, what doesn't work. Shift. So. I would just love to be in the um, arena with you all hands on trying things out. All right, thank you, Stephen. Uh, I'm going to say it's not that hard. <laughs> keep it simple and keep it like facility based as much as you can. Excellent. And. Yeah, so, not to sound like a broken record, but I would um, ditto what everyone has said. It, it doesn't have to be complicated. Um, but then also just sort of bring to light a couple of um, potential challenges or things to keep keep your eye on based on our experience. One is um, the messaging, not only to the staff, but to the patients. I think, um, you know, how your, your team communicates to the patients that this is a great alternative is really important. And then just keeping our eye on um, Revenue sources, you know, if our reimbursement um, goes away at some point, just thinking proactively to um, revenue sources to to continue. Thank you. And finally, Caitlin. I guess my advice would be. I have a couple of things. So one would be to just jump in, rip the bandaid off. It doesn't have to be perfectly set in stone before you start kind of mimicking what Karen said. Um, and then the other is kind of mimicking what Drew had said earlier, where you can really innovate with this and make it fun and, um, you know, have your team be able to try different things and do it their way. I think we'll add a lot of job satisfaction and engagement from the team. So, you know, just try what you can. All right, thank you very much. Uh, in the interest of time, it, uh, we're just going to skip over. We tried to respond to uh, comments in the in the chat, but if you have others, um, uh, by all means, put those in there and we'll see if we can follow up from you. But we did want to mention as we wrap up the available resources that have been produced or are being produced as a part of this work group. So um, all of them, which uh, includes a set of overview slides and implementation guide and, and, and additional resources guide that are, you know, things that work group members have found useful, all of those will eventually be available on the Take Heart website. Um, uh, as a part of the overall take heart re, uh, materials, uh, including the video that we played a, a short segment of today. So all of those are going to be available. And then if we go to the next slide, you'll see that um, they'll be on the new take heart website. Um, uh, we did post a link for the video that you can access even now, but by mid December, they'll all be on the new take heart website. Um, and um, we will update all of the people on this group. Um, we will circulate the slides from today's event uh, and, and, and a link to the recording as well. So if we go to our last slide, 
Um, uh, as I said, the, the slides and other resources will be shared, and we'd love to get your feedback on the event, your reactions to the video. So as you wrap up, if you could just take a second and respond to those last um, uh, questions, it'll just take you a minute, and the, and the feedback is very helpful for us. I want to thank um, all of our panelists for today, as well as all of our work group members for their valuable uh, insights into hybrid cardiac rehabilitation. We hope this has given you some good ideas on how to approach this issue and the value of doing this um, or considering doing it for your patients. Um, I, I've really been impressed um, as someone that's not a part of the cardiac rehabilitation community at the passion that you show for your patients and really wanting what's absolutely the best for them. Uh, and as we wrap up the Take Heart Project, we wanna just wish you all the best personally and, and for your programs as you continue to serve patients that, that really need the services that you're offering to them. So thank you all for your time this afternoon. Thank you for your contributions to your patients and your communities. And we hope you have a fabulous uh, rest of your day and a fabulous holiday season as well.